My name's Liz Chester and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the Institute. Uh, for many of you, I imagine it might be the first time that you've come to us and we're really thrilled that you've made the effort to come here. We have a range of research programs, more than 200, looking at a whole stack of aspects around healthy development from before birth to um, children through adolescence and teenagers. And as much as we love getting the information in, it's equally important that we get the information out and this is what this is all about tonight. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that this institute has been built on, the Noongar people, and their elders past and present. This is the first of our public seminar series for the year, and there'll be more to come. So uh, we hope that you might be interested in tracking some of the research that's coming out of here as your children develop throughout life. The presentations will be followed by a question and answer session, so I hope that you save up all those great questions because I know our panel are very keen to, uh, to respond to all of the sorts of things that might have just been trickling at the back of your mind. The session, let me introduce you to our wonderful presenters tonight, and I think Dr. Monique Robinson went above and beyond the call of duty because she's actually pregnant herself. And I think she did that specifically for this particular presentation. So Monique will be leading us through it tonight. Thank you very much, Monique. Monique is a psychologist from background, but also uh, very much involved in all aspects of pregnancy in her research and a regular writer uh, for a number of publications like The Conversation and Mamma Mia and some other sites that you might be familiar with. Um, if I could also introduce to you Associate Professor Kim Guilfi, who's an exercise physiologist with UWA who will give you all the good information on how much, when, too much, not, all of those sorts of things that probably you've been wondering about as well. Also as part of our panel to answer your questions, I'm really thrilled to welcome back to the Institute Dr Hannah Moore who's an infectious diseases researcher but she hasn't been with us for a few months because she's just had her first baby as well. So she can speak as a mum and she can speak as a researcher and she can certainly speak about infectious diseases. And I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome today Louise Keyes, who's the National Director of the Australian College of Midwives, a Western Australia branch, because midwifery is at the very centre of everything we're talking about tonight, and I'm sure she'll also be able to answer many of your questions. All right, let's get this started, because I know there's lots of material we'd like to share with you tonight, and I hand you over to gorgeous Dr Monique Robinson. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. Again, thank you very much for coming along tonight. It's really um, important to us to get some of this information out, but I guess a disclaimer to start with of what we're going to talk about, this is really the tip of the iceberg. We could be here for hours and hours, and if you, any of you have bought the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting the sort of Encyclopedia of Pregnancy, you'll know how massive it is, and we're not planning to cover it all tonight. What we are going to cover is uh, a little bit like what you may have seen in the West Australian yesterday in, in the, the article that they wrote, a bit about the culture of risk during pregnancy because this is something that we've started to observe becoming a bigger and bigger influence on women. And we'll talk about the reasons why we might be evaluating risk differently at the moment um, for pregnancy and then go through the 10 most common pregnancy risks or 10 very common pregnancy risks and talk about the science behind them, why we recommend what we recommend for those things. Um, Kim is here, she's uh, an exercise in pregnancy expert so she's going to talk about the sorts of exercise that you can do during pregnancy and you'll see as we go through and you may have also had advice as you've gone through um, pregnancies yourself that there's a, a lot of advice out there on what to do and it's sort of hard to know um, where to set those boundaries. Unfortunately, uh, our dietitian, um, Dr. Therese O'Sullivan, has also just had her first child, and so she couldn't make it tonight. She's having a baby with some sleeping issues this week. So, uh, but we do have her slides here, and I'll talk to those um, for her to give you a little bit of background. And diet's another big topic um, during pregnancy. Lastly, we're going to talk about a positive way forward. So, if we're going to start with this culture of risk, what can we do to make things a little bit different? Start with. I started to notice being a researcher that when the research went out there, sometimes the way that it was presented may have been creating a little bit of stress and a little bit of fear. So for me, that's kind of ironic because my research is on stress in pregnancy and, and how we can reduce it. But sometimes I started to think, I wonder if this is actually stressing women out more. Stress in pregnancy is my research causing it. 
Um, and, and headings and, and generally uh, all of the research that I've done has been really, really well reported. It's just that when it's a very sensitive time, it can be quite difficult to see sort of headlines like this. Even more difficult, and this is from the US, from the President's Cancer Panel in 2010, babies born pre-polluted. It started to get quite emotive out there in these sort of messages. And a mum who wants only to do the best thing for her baby can be a little bit frightened by some of these messages. Also, there's been a lot of changes in, in pregnancy. Now, death in childbirth was actually didn't start to decrease until around about the 1930s with the advent and the more um, common introduction of caesarean sections and penicillin. So actually, that's not that long ago. And our grandmothers, um, it may have been more of an issue. And so that fear around childbirth is sort of a bit of a historical artefact that, that is sometimes there. The thalidomide disaster in the late 50s and 60s uh, was a, it was a morning sickness drug that was prescribed. Around the rate of birth defects after taking thalidomide was discovered to be about one in four, so it was, it was quite common uh, as, a, as a toxin during pregnancy. That frightened a lot of people, and it also created an idea that sometimes things that you take uh, during pregnancy and things that you would think might be helping you might be causing risk. Uh, Agent Orange is another example, and Chernobyl, where we saw these effects of environmental pollution and birth defects. Then there's the increasing surveillance of pregnancy, and in medicine in general. Uh, but for pregnancy, and, and if you are pregnant or have been recently, you'll know that there's a lot more scans on offer, where, where previously you may have had one scan or maybe two, scan during, two scans during your pregnancy. Um, now you could be scanned every few weeks as you go through that's great. That's absolutely fantastic. Also, prenatal testing, you probably will be offered a lot of different tests to what you may have been 10 or certainly 20 years ago. Fantastic, but can make you think a lot more about the risk and, and think about what, what's this test going to say? Is everything going to be all right? There's a lot of change in um, the medical legal context of pregnancy in terms of insurance, uh, malpractice insurance, and that does dictate what care providers um, will do and, and the risks that they're willing to take as well. And so while that may not affect you as the patient, it's the bigger picture sometimes of what's going on. And finally, there's the social media. And that really is something that um, is having a big influence. And, and, and again, fantastic. It can be a great support to be able to go onto a blog and to talk to people at the same stage of pregnancy. Um, but it also can be quite scary. And I know myself, you know, I feel like I've got quite a good background in this area. I can go online and think, oh, gosh, I didn't actually think, think of that symptom. So it, it's a big thing. What we decided to do last year was to get um, a group of uh, women and we also had uh, one dad together to talk about what the culture of risk is at the moment in pregnancy, how they're seeing these sort of things. And we had two main themes come out of that. We had the information overload of being told, no, you can't do this and you absolutely mustn't do that. Um, the gestational Google mania, this is from an article that was in WA Today uh, on the weekend where uh, one of the reporters was talking about the fact that she just couldn't stop Googling everything. People are reading one thing and then something else is telling them the exact opposite. Should you be playing classical music to your tummy and why aren't you? Um, these ideas that maybe I should be reading Tolstoy to my child while it's in utero so that it'll grow up to have, be a fan of art and literature. And, and, and as much as some of these things are, are pretty funny, in different um, sort of levels of severity, they're really happening. These are the sort of stories that are getting shared. And a slightly more anxious mum might be thinking, oh gosh, I haven't done that. My child's already behind, hasn't even been born yet. Then there's the horror stories. People say, oh, you're pregnant. Let me tell you how terrible my birth was. Let me tell you, uh, you know, how awful it is. You must know these sort of things. So there's information overload. People also talked a lot about social expectations, and this was quite interesting. So yes, there's the yummy mummies of all these mums who get back. How I got thin fast. No one ever gets thin slow. It's always, it's always about getting thin again. Um, and seeing these kind of images of motherhood and, and women all dressed up and women who seem to be coping brilliantly. There's the other people saying, oh, I wouldn't be doing that. Uh, doubts are really hard to admit. A lot of women say that they're just pretending that everything's fine because they need to save face because everyone else seems to be coping, so I'll pretend that I fit in with everyone else. Expectations. One was to have a certain number of children, of people feeling this pressure of what other people say you should be doing as a mother, how many children you should be having, when you should be having them. 
Um, and, and women also spoke about doing things differently, how hard it is to break the mould. And, and one woman said, you know, it was really hard for me because I had two children by two different fathers and the way that I was treated um, through, through that experience by others. So we thought, how are these messages perceived? And as we talked amongst the group, they talked about it creating a worried well where women were, were sort of, I guess, pregnancies being pathologised, if you like, or medicalised. Um, the mummy wars, this fighting with each other and judging each other. And this all kind of ended up in a lack of trust both of um, yourself but also of your care providers around you because if, if someone else is telling you something different to what they've said, who do you really trust? Now, the mummy wars um, is something we did speak about in, in the interview in the paper. A lot of it uh, has been based on this stay-at-home mum versus the working mum. I think this picture is amazing because it shows this very glamorous working mum and the kind of more dowdy um, stay-at-home mum. This fight that you should be doing this or you shouldn't be doing that. Childcare always comes into that, whether you should be doing that or you shouldn't be doing that. And then are you mum enough, which I think is such a powerful, powerful image. This was about attachment parenting and this lady breastfeeding the six-year-old. All of these sort of things, are you mum enough, kind of challenging each other, of is, can you do this, are you as good as these other people, and seeing these images. This is a, a French writer, Elizabeth Badinter, who wrote this book, The Conflict, which was actually released a couple of years ago, but only came out last year in, in English. Um, and she talks again about the fact that why are we fighting each other? Why is the stay-at-home mum fighting the, uh, the working mum to say which one's better? And this is a really poignant example, I think, of, of the mummy wars. This was Rebecca Judd, uh, wife of Chris Judd, the footballer, and she went into the media to talk about her problems breastfeeding, that she'd had mastitis, to try and encourage awareness that sometimes things don't go to plan. A really, really lovely idea. Unfortunately, the social media comments were things like, oh, yeah, it's so hard to be a footballer's wife. Yeah, suck it up, princess. All these things. And I thought, gosh, and this is maybe something to do with social networking in general that we're seeing this trolling coming through. Okay, so ultimately most women want to do the best thing for their child, but there is no recipe for the perfect baby and while our medical technology has come a long way, in high risk circumstances you can have a perfectly normal baby. In low risk circumstances there can be a baby that might have a problem and we just don't know what, what causes a lot of these issues. So it's about accepting that a level of risk is always going to be there, but not letting that, that risk define um, your pregnancy. So let's talk about some of the, the common risk factors. I've developed this traffic light system which is a bit naff but bear with me here. We've got the red light for the things that we recommend to try and avoid. We've got the amber light for the things that we say proceed with caution and ask your care provider. So these are things where you really need to go back to that, that person um, who's got the experience who you trust and ask them. Then there's green light, things that are actually pretty much low risk that we can, we can say. So we'll start with probably the biggest doozy, which is, which is alcohol. And there's a lot of opinions on here and, and you'll be getting a lot of different opinions from those around you, from your doctors. Um, you would be getting different opinions depending on when you had your baby. For the national guidelines on alcohol um, safe alcohol consumption and alcohol during pregnancy, the advice is that the safest option is not to drink. However, women will often say to me, well, how come my obstetrician said that a little bit here and there is okay? And even in the national guidelines, it says it's, the risk is likely to be low if you've only been drinking light amounts, say one or two glasses a week, um, before you knew you were pregnant. And people say, well, I smell a rat here. How come it's okay before I knew I was pregnant? But and photos of rats are actually really quite icky, so I, I got a cartoon rat. Um, <laughs> um, how come it's all right if I, if I didn't know I was pregnant, but it's not if I do know I was pregnant? And so this is where I think it's it, the great thing about tonight is we can start to explain a little bit of this. What we know is that studies are, are inconsistent in terms of the very low amount of alcohol. There's not a lot of grey area in terms of heavy alcohol consumption. We know that that's a, a, what we call a teratogen, something that can cause harm to the baby. And uh, we know fetal alcohol syndrome that you may have seen is the effect that we'll see in children and really, really devastating. At the very low end of that spectrum, there's some studies that say there's no risk, there's some that say there is risk. And what, if you can think back to um, drinking sort of outside of pregnancy, 
and the, the idea of the two-pot screamer or, or the, the idea that some people don't handle alcohol the same as others. What we don't know when we do this, some of these studies is how each individual woman's metabolism is processing the alcohol. And there's just been some recent studies um, by an epidemiologist, George Davies Smith, in the UK, looking at actually genetic profiles and, and trying to establish what it is about some women that they can process alcohol in a different way to others. And is that what is what's causing the uncertainty with the research? Now, when there is uncertainty with research, when we think that some women may be affected differently to other women, we just can't say that a little bit is safe. So at the same time, before you knew you were pregnant, and I found out I was pregnant on, on Christmas Eve, so there's the festive season in there, which, you know, even, again, even for me, thinking, oh, gosh, how many champagnes did I have at that Christmas party on, on Saturday night? It, it's a scary thing, and you think, oh, I don't want to have done something without knowingly... Um, have harmed my baby but you can't do anything about it now so that's one of the reasons that we say once you find out you're pregnant that's when you can abstain from alcohol before that try not to worry about it the other thing is again we don't have the evidence that the level of um, drinking of, of very low levels is going to cause harm okay cigarette smoking is different we know that smoking is bad and, and it's it's bad for a lot of reasons we also know that still 12% of women in WA uh, smoke during their pregnancy and the Chrissy Swan thing earlier this year showed that perhaps the number's a lot higher because there could be women who just don't want to admit that they've had trouble quitting smoking who are doing it very privately and, and in Chrissy's case um, hadn't even told her husband. It's never too late to quit and there's uh, the Quit campaign has the Quit For You, Quit For Two uh, advice online we found in, in research here that women who quit um, partway through pregnancy, they avoid, their children avoid the same negative outcomes that the women who continue to smoke did. And there's other research in, in similar areas that are also showing that. It's a really important thing that we support women who are trying to quit. And I know, um, you know, and you can drive past King Edward and you see women smoking while pregnant. For a lot of people, that's, that's a horrible sight. But often... There, there's social factors that are tied up there. We know smoking in pregnancy is linked to uh, lower ed education, to younger mums, uh, to women with lower incomes, women from poorer neighbourhoods. So these are women who really deserve our support. And, and that's the sort of thing, if, if we can kind of draw more attention to the fact of what can we do to help those 12% who are still smoking to quit, we really do improve outcomes for babies. But we're a red light here as well, with, as well as with alcohol. Getting to a green light caffeine, to a limit. So you can have a cup of coffee while you're pregnant. You can have a coffee that's from a coffee machine rather than instant coffee, which has less caffeine. In the average cup of coffee, there's between 60 and 120 milligrams of caffeine. You probably, in terms of the risk uh, literature in this area, you don't want more than about 300 milligrams. So that can be two or three coffees. The trick is with this is there's a lot of other things that um, contain caffeine. Tea has low levels of caffeine but still has caffeine. Um, Coca-Cola. Energy drinks are massive and we've got a, a, a new researcher here, Gina Trapp, who's doing a lot of research on energy drinks now and it's quite a new area because they haven't been around that long but they are growing uh, rapidly and the amount of caffeine in some of these drinks is really quite frightening. So while the use of energy drinks is growing, and it seems to be growing in a younger population, but still, while it's growing, that's something we really need to be aware of because people think of coffee when they think of caffeine, not all the other things. And some chocolate as well has caffeine. But generally, we've got a green light for caffeine to a certain level. The cat litter. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't touch the poo when I change the cat litter. But you'd think when you read some of these things that this is a lot more, more dangerous than it is. Toxoplasmosis, which is the infection that we're worried about, which is, um, kind of comes from the cat gut after eating rats and, and various um, things. It's not a, not a pretty image. Uh, but toxoplasmosis can be very dangerous for the baby. It can lead to stillbirth and, and miscarriage. It's also in research, and this was, I think, reported um, through the media quite heavily at the end of last year, linked to schizophrenia and brain cancer. The thing is, when they did this, there is no higher rate of schizophrenia and brain cancer in cat owners. So while toxoplasmosis is a problem, it's not necessarily something to do with cats. Um, well, it may be that the cat owners have immunity to it. 
In general with these, I've got uh, the orange light. Is, yes, toxoplasmosis is something we want to avoid. But again, you don't necessarily touch these things. Use gloves, wash your hands. Gardening, again, for the same reason, it's like a big litter tray out in the garden there if you've got a cat or you've got a cat in the neighbourhood so you don't know what you're coming across. So again, just kind of taking precautions using gloves. But it's nothing, and again, before you knew you were pregnant, it's nothing to worry that you've done some long-lasting harm. Listeria is something, I have a red light on this, it used to be very, very rare. However, in January 2013, as you may remember, uh, there was a problem with Jindy and Waddle Valley cheeses where there was a listeria outbreak in those products. So while perhaps last year I might have said, it, look, it's very rare and maybe giving it a bit of an orange light, we do, I think it's something that you can stay away from. It's probably not going to disturb your quality of life too much if you're not able to have um, a bit of brie cheese or, or pate. So the thing, sort of things that we're um, looking at here are basically things that are cold. The um, cooking process kills this bacteria. Uh, processed meats, so ham, uh, salad bars that are kind of open where the food's been sitting there a long time. You've got your soft cheeses and your unpasteurised uh, dairy products. Soft serve, unfortunately, is, is out for the time that you're pregnant. Uh, pate, there's a couple of reasons with pate because it's also got other vitamins that you don't want to overdo during pregnancy in, in liver, uh, and raw fish and, and sushi that's been sitting there for a long time as well. So again, red light because we can avoid those things. Diet soft drinks. Now a friend of mine, Amy Morrison, who um, I know through work, she writes a blog called The Pregnant Chicken, which some of you may have seen, looking at pregnancy sunny side up. She said that when she wrote about diet soft drinks being safe during pregnancy, there was absolute uproar. People couldn't believe that she could possibly suggest these were safe. Such is the hysteria over, over diet soft drinks. The main chemical that people are worried about is aspartame. Um, there was a, a hoax theory that it was an ant poison that had sort of tasted nice uh, and, and that when the body processes it, it processes it into formaldehyde and, again, that the levels and the risk were all blown out of proportion there. There was also a study in 2010 that linked um, drinking diet soft drinks to preterm birth. However, what they found was that it was a, probably a bit more of a relationship about smoking and, and low socioeconomic status, which were linked with um, heavy consumption of diet soft drinks. There was a lot of um, diet soft drinks being um, consumed. And it also was linked with um, mothers who were um, heavier and therefore had a higher risk of blood pressure problems. We know that blood pressure problems during pregnancy can often be a risk factor for preterm birth. And it only affected the very late preterm birth. And really, if we were thinking this was a, a big effect, we'd be thinking it would affect all levels of preterm birth, babies born sort of from 25 weeks onwards, not just those born at 34, 35 weeks. The exception is if you have PKU, um, and you will know if you, you have that. And that's a, a difficulty processing this particular... Um, it's a, a sort of recessive disorder, but you will know if you have that thing, and, that, and that's where aspartame's not a good thing to be drinking anyway. So green light. Vitamin D is a massive green light, but deficiency in pregnancy is common and you really wouldn't think it was going to be that common in Australia. There's been a recent link to um, increased pregnancy complications if you've got vitamin D deficiency, um, but it's pretty easy to, to fix. The main source is sunlight, particularly important for those who are pregnant now as we go into the winter months to make sure that you've got around 5 to 10 minutes of sun exposure each day um, on skin that's, that's not protected. During winter we can do these things without worrying about the UV index. It gets a little harder in summer but it's a really good thing um, to talk to your doctor about if you're worried about how to get the sun exposure while also not increasing your risk. <laughs> Cleaning products and pesticides, uh, household cleaners that contain ammonia and chlorine uh, have been implicated in various studies, often with respiratory problems like asthma. Other studies find that there's no link. So we've got an amber light here of proceed with caution. Don't be kind of wafting in the fumes of the ammonia. Maybe don't clean the house so much. Really sort of toxic um, cleaning products like oven cleaner. Don't clean the oven perhaps during, during your pregnancy. Again, it's just being cautious without being overly worried. Pest control treatments. You may have seen the Institute had an um, article in the paper last week reporting a study that was recently done on termite and spider and ant pest control treatments in the year before pregnancy. They found there was a small increased risk for childhood brain tumours. 
However, it was a very small risk. It did not affect um, those who were pregnant at the time in the significant numbers. And it was one of those studies that I think we need to interpret with caution in terms of waiting till there's a little bit more to add to the story before we panic too much about these things. Again, an amber light, if you uh, need to get a pest control treatment, it might be good to wait till after after pregnancy. The research and environmental risk factors is really, really rapidly evolving because we're starting to learn more and more about these things and our exposures. So it's an interesting area, I think, to, to keep an eye on. Antidepressants during pregnancy. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist and I'm not going to go into great detail here. There's a lot that we could say. Broadly, antidepressants refer to a very, it's an umbrella term for a lot of different drugs. Uh, commonly, ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are the most modern class. And dosage differs remarkably. So if we see something saying antidepressants are or are not safe, there's a lot of detail underneath those sort of statements. The risk is very commonly overestimated that people worry a lot about the effect of taking um, antidepressants during pregnancy. And it's a real benefit versus risk kind of way up that we need to do because we know that untreated depression during pregnancy is also not good for mother or baby. So we really need to manage this. It's a proceed with caution and really talk to your care provider about this. There is a small increased risk of preterm birth. There's some studies that have found increases in, very, very small increases in birth defects for antidepressants, others that haven't found anything like that. So it's the uncertainty there. The effect on preterm birth, interestingly, was the same for untreated depression and the as it was for being on SSRIs all the way through pregnancy. And so, again, we might be trying to avoid one risk and, and, and causing another or exposing ourselves to another. Paroxetine is the only drug in that. It's uh, Arapax or Paxil, various other names that they don't like you to take during pregnancy. The important thing with these is never stop suddenly, and that's the rule generally with antidepressant medication. We never want anyone to say, right, I'm just going to stop now. It's something you really need to talk to your care provider about how you manage these risks. But, but not to, to panic. Stress is, I guess, what I think is a bit of a sleeper risk factor. We talk a lot about smoking and alcohol and different things. We don't talk much about stress. But it is a factor in, in increased peat and birth and also increased mental health problems. It's very, very common in pregnancy because pregnancy induces a lot of um, changes that might cause stress. It can be exacerbated by this perception of risk that we talked about earlier for some women and you just can't avoid it we can't say to women okay just don't be stressed it's fine don't worry be happy it's the biggest song of avoidance ever um of denial but we can learn how to recognize it and how to manage it during pregnancy if you're an anxious person going into pregnancy it's really good to be able to keep a bit of an eye on your stress levels because perhaps you may be more susceptible to some of these things than someone who's who's very laid back um, naturally how to manage? Well, social support is brilliant and if you've got um, a partner with you or someone who's close to you that you can talk through some of these things, then that's fantastic. It really does help. Um, light exercise, as Kim will, will go through later. Um, yoga relaxation. I don't always like saying that because it sort of seems like rather an upper class um, thing to do, yoga and relaxation. But if it's something that works for you, just having that time to relax and, and doing the prenatal yoga classes, then that's great. Ask for help. People often don't want to let others know that they need a bit of help. And then when you're offered help, accept it. Reading magazines, watching TV, just letting yourself sit on the couch and do nothing for a while. Talking to your employer, one of the biggest sources of stress that women tell us about is not knowing when to tell their, their boss that they are pregnant and then sort of having a very difficult time managing their workload with the tiredness, with morning sickness and everything there. So definitely we advise you to talk to your employer. Hire a gatekeeper, and by this I mean if you have trouble saying no, get someone else who's close to you to say no for you. So that might be a partner um, who you can say, you know what, we can't come to this thing on Saturday night because you know, she's tired, or someone who can do those kind of that heavy lifting for you if you find those sort of things hard. And positive thoughts. And um, Kim Clark, who I share an office with, he said, you know, when you see Usain Bolt before a race, he doesn't look stressed, does he? He said, imagine if we all just approached big things in our life not being stressed about it. Maybe we'd win the race instead of the person who's so worried about it. So again, just thinking more positively about things and trying to relax before things may even increase um, your success. If you are feeling overwhelmed, we have a lot of resources here um, with Renee Gibson here um, tonight. 
Uh, there's the address for Beyond Blue. Please talk to your um, GP, who's the first point of call for um, the Medicare uh, Better Access Program. There's also resources that Renee has, um, and, and on Beyond Blue as well, for partners, because it's not just um, about the, the woman who's pregnant, it's about dads as well and, and partners. Uh, and FIFO families is a, is a big issue in WA, and, and that can make managing these things quite different. And if you have a history of depression or anxiety, there's a special booklet. This is um, one of them. But there's another one that can talk you through, if you already have a history of anxiety or depression, how to cope with pregnancy. That's often something that women are a bit frightened of if they do have the history of, of whether these things, they might be at higher risk. So there's brochures after the seminar. And I'm going to pass you over to Kim so you can stop hearing my voice for a while and, and then I'll come back. Hi everyone, my name's Kim. As you can see, I'm from the School of Sports Science, Exercise and Health at the University of Western Australia, hence my part of today's presentation will be on exercise during pregnancy. Um, it may not come as a surprise to many of you that in the past, pregnant women have often been discouraged from participating in exercise. Most of this, I guess, concern has come more so from social and cultural biases, more so than scientific evidence. What we do know today is that there are many, many benefits of participating in, exercising, participating in exercise during pregnancy, some of which I'll mention here. Uh, the first, and probably one of the most important, being um, a maintenance of aerobic fitness, or at least not letting the fitness decline too much during pregnancy. This is beneficial in terms of managing the fatigue that's often associated with pregnancy as well as helping to keep you prepared for probably what will be the biggest physical challenge of life, which is giving birth to a baby in, in itself. That's a, that's a physical event and, and being fit will definitely prepare you for that. Uh, it's been shown that regular exercise assists with mobility. Uh, nearly 50% of women suffer back pain during pregnancy. Regular exercise can assist with this as well as just assisting with some of the general physical discomforts that we find come with pregnancy. Prevention of excessive weight gain is obviously a very important issue and then sort of relating to what Monique was talking about helps to, in, I guess, enhance or psychological wellbeing. So we've got some of the issues that were spoken about there in terms of managing stress, um, decreased risk of anxiety as well as depression. And the last point I want to make is uh, there's some evidence to suggest that regular exercise can help decrease risk of preeclampsia, which is a condition that uh, is very serious and affects blood pressure during pregnancy, and also perhaps some evidence to suggest it can assist with decreasing the risk of pregnancy diabetes. And that's one of my specific research interests, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, at the end of my section today. As well as those benefits during pregnancy, we've got benefits associated with the labour itself. So you'd probably be very excited to hear uh, decreased length of labour, decreased rates of medical intervention during labour, and also benefits to the baby. Um, I've just listed here decreased risk of high birth weight, but there are numerous benefits to the baby. Um, this one's of particular importance because um, babies that are, are very large uh, have increased risks later on in life in terms of obesity, heart disease and diabetes. Um, so it, it helps decrease the risk of having babies that are too big. In terms of what we should be doing for exercise, you might be surprised to know that the guidelines aren't too different during pregnancy to what we suggest for the population as a whole, except we have a few uh, special considerations, obviously, for the pregnant woman. So in general, we suggest that all women with uncomplicated pregnancy should be participating in a combination of aerobic and strength conditioning. Obviously the aim is not to reach peak fitness. You know, when you're pregnant, that's not when you suddenly decide to fulfill your lifelong desire running the city to surf. Okay? It's not about achieving peak fitness. It's, it's just about, I guess, minimising any, any decline in fitness um, that we tend to naturally see with pregnancy. Um, the advice that I'll continue to give relates to these uncomplicated pregnancies. For anyone with a complicated pregnancy, and, and this can be a number of different conditions, too many to list here, um, you should seek medical advice. And often you'll know if you, you fall into that category. 
So in terms of aerobic exercise, I've listed probably the, th the three most commonly prescribed modes here. Uh, brisk walking would be the most common uh, and most popular, I would say, during pregnancy. Beneficial in that, I guess you don't need any sort of specialised equipment, anyone can do it. Uh, I guess the only limitation is towards the end of pregnancy. It, it cannot, it can be, become a bit more difficult. Um, then we have stationary cycling. I say stationary cycling rather than getting out on your bike and riding on the road because the risk of falling off your bike um, or being hit is, is not ideal during pregnancy. Um, so stationary cycling is a great mode of exercise during pregnancy because it takes the load off. Um, so you, you're weight supported to some extent. And I guess compared to walking, stationary cycling, you can be indoors. So if it's a hot day outside, you can make sure you've got fan or aircon on and stay cool. And also coming into winter where the days are getting, I guess, shorter, it's getting darker sooner and, and cold and rainy, um, you can exercise in the comfort of your own home while Bold and the Beautiful's on in front of you watching uh, while you're watching TV. Um, swimming and water-based exercise is, is often promoted during pregnancy. Um, women enjoy the feeling of being in the water while pregnant because it, it takes the load off. Um, the the uh, hydrostatic pressure of the water on, on the body as well helps with um, the swelling that some women can experience. So the feeling that you get in water, um, women will often find quite desirable. A really common question relates to running. Um, I would say that if you have not been a previous runner, um, pregnancy is not the time to start running. Uh, this has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, but if you're someone that's always been a regular runner, uh, it's, it's okay to continue running provided you listen closely to your body and you have uh, a very good pelvic floor. So you need to be doing your pelvic floor exercises at the same time. In terms of activities to avoid, I think this is really common sense. You want to avoid any sort of activity where the there's the potential for contact or trauma to the abdominal area. So, um, you know, team sports, there's potential, um, potential danger there, depending on the level of contact involved. And any activity that, that will affect, um, well, that you have a risk of falling over given the fact that the centre of gravity changes a lot during pregnancy so your balance isn't quite what, it, what it's been previously. So they're the types of exercise you, you may like to engage in. Now we're going to talk a bit about how much and this is where I said the guidelines aren't that different to what, what all of us should be aspiring to whether pregnant or not and that is uh, around 30 minutes on most days of the week. Um, I've said here three to five days of the week um, for people that perhaps haven't been regular exercisers previously and that gives you the opportunity to have a day in between for rest and recovery. As I said, 30 minutes up to about 45 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity and I'll tell you on the next slide how you know that you're exercising at a moderate intensity. Now, I'm going to give two different suggestions here based on whether or not you have someone that perhaps hasn't done exercise previously or you're a regular exerciser. For someone that hasn't been a regular exerciser in the past, pregnancy is a great time to start. Don't think I've never exercised previously. I'm not going to start during pregnancy. Small bits make a really big difference. So for someone that hasn't exercised previously, I suggest 15 minutes three times a week brisk walking or whatever you find enjoyable, okay? Aiming to build that up to 30 minutes four times a week with a nice slow progression. And look, we often find the second trimester is the best time to progress because that's for most women when the morning sickness has subsided and feeling a bit better about things uh, as opposed to the third semester, uh, trimester where obviously you're gaining a bit more weight and it's a bit more difficult to, to get around. For women that have previously been active, probably their main focus should be limiting the duration of exercise. I've said 45 minutes here, maybe up to 60 minutes as long as you're um, following a few guidelines which I'll mention in a couple of slides. So up here I've highlighted moderate intensity physical activity. How do you know that you're working at a moderate level? What I've got here is a, a chart we use. It's called rating of perceived exertion. And we show this often to people and ask them when they're exercising, how hard do you feel like you're working right now? 
and moderate intensity physical activity sits somewhere between 12 and 14 on this scale. So you want to feel like you're working somewhat hard. Not hard, if you're working hard you probably pushed it a bit too much, but not fairly light. So somewhat hard, a little bit of huff and puff is where you want to aim for. For maybe the more uh, regular exerciser that perhaps has monitored their heart rate previously. Um, we do have heart rate zones. This is a bit too complex for most people. Just guide going for your, your somewhat hard is where most people need to aim. But for someone that did want to monitor their heart rate during exercise, whether through a heart rate monitor or just counting their pulse beats, um, this gives you a rough guide. If you're previously sedentary or, or inactive, you'd go at the bottom end of that scale. And for someone that's always been a regular exerciser, you could work towards the, the upper end of that scale. In terms of resistance training, this is a little bit like running in that we don't have too much research here. Uh, I would suggest that if you haven't previously been a regular attendee at the gym, uh, lifting weights, pregnancy would not be the time to start. But as for running, if, if you previously participate in this sort of activity, you can continue provided you, you take a few precautions which I've mentioned here. Um, definitely not holding the breath, definitely not straining, so you don't want to be lifting weights that are that heavy that you need to strain. Uh, low, again moderate intensity, keeping it to that somewhat hard range. And for anyone that attends the gym regularly, they'll know what I mean by reps. 12 to 15 repetitions without undue fatigue. So you should be able to do 12 or 15 repeats of whatever exercise it is that you're doing um, without feeling too exhausted at the end. Um, avoiding walking lunges is important for the pelvic floor and also lifting while flat on the back. I'll explain why um, you want to avoid lifting flat on the back in a couple of slides time. Slow and steady, I guess when you're using free weights you've just got to be careful that there's no risk at all of um, hitting the abdominal area or dropping a weight so that's important to consider. And look, probably with both aerobic and resistance exercise the most important thing is to listen to your body because you'll know your boundaries, you'll know sort of if you've pushed it too hard. Um, although I said I wouldn't start resistance training during pregnancy if I hadn't been a previous resistance trainer. Um, your abdominal and pelvic floor exercises, they sit separate to that, so everyone should be doing those exercises. I just wanted to mention that. So these are our, our special considerations. I mentioned lying on the back, lying supine. Um, after the first trimester, you don't want to do any sort of exercises or activities that involve lying on the back, and essentially that's because the growing baby um, puts pressure on a large vein which sits behind where the uterus sits and, and that can impair blood flow back to the heart um, and cause some issues. So you don't want to do any exercises lying on the back. Avoiding heat is, is quite important. I mentioned the benefit of the stationary bike, um, being able to avoid the heat if it's a hot day outside. Um, Basically, this is most important in the first trimester, but it's important in general that, that you don't get too hot. So making sure you're, you're well hydrated, you're dressed appropriately for exercise and you're not exercising outside in, in the middle of the day, really just common sense. I've mentioned falling or impact injury. Something I haven't mentioned and you may not be aware of is the fact that uh, during pregnancy, some of the hormones that get elevated actually make a lot of our ligaments lax or loose in preparation for the baby to make its arrival into the world. But those ligaments are affected all over the body. So the ligaments in the knee, the ligaments in the ankle, they'll also become loose. Uh, so you need to be really careful with, with team sport activities where you've got sudden changes of direction. You're perhaps at increased risk of spraining an ankle or, or doing a ligament in the knee. So any sort of jarring exercises you do need to be aware of. Obviously during pregnancy, you're, you're tighter as well, so that's another increasing predisposition to injury. And sudden changes in posture, I just mentioned that because we, get, we tend to notice a decrease in blood pressure, particularly in the second trimester of pregnancy, and that means if you're doing any sort of exercise where you're going from lying to standing quickly, um, you, you perhaps uh, are increasing your risk of passing out fainting. So you need to make sure that sudden changes in posture um, you do that nice and slowly and also if you are exercising you don't suddenly stop exercising your warm-up and cool-down are particularly important during pregnancy 
Uh, just quickly, after baby is born, we encourage exercise for m much the same reasons as during pregnancy, plus we have the added benefit of decreased risk of postnatal depression. The return to activity should be gradual. This will obviously depend on the mode of delivery, whether by caesarean or vaginally. And I guess just not being too hard on yourself. You're going to have a limited time, the added fatigue of newborn care. Um, again, emphasising the importance of strengthening the pelvic floor. Uh, the last point, though, I think is important for people to know. There's been concern previously that exercise can affect the volume of milk produced and the composition of, of breast milk produced. That's not the case. So you can exercise safely knowing that it's not affecting um, the, the delivery of milk. So just to sort of sum up my section, uh, if you have a healthy pregnancy, you should definitely be participating in exercise. The aim is not to, as I said before, achieve peak fitness, but simply keep the body moving. Now, if you find the idea of participating in 30 minutes of exercise most days of the week a little overwhelming, maybe a more simple message is just try and keep moving or keep active every day in as many ways as you can. So the silly things you hear about all the time, like taking the stairs instead of the elevator, um, parking the car a little further from where you need to be to, to get a bit of extra movement in, all of that is just as beneficial. Okay. Um, the reason why is obviously both for yourself and for baby because the environment that you do expose the baby to um, yeah, can, can give great benefits in the future. I'm just going to sum up before I pass um, back to Monique. I mentioned before that one of my particular research interests is the cycle study. Um, this here is one of our research participants in the cycle study. The cycle study is looking at whether or not regular exercise during pregnancy can decrease the recurrence of GDM, gestational diabetes, or diabetes in pregnancy. And we're still looking for people to be involved in this research. It's a great research study. If you sign up, essentially you have a 50-50 chance of having a stationary bike delivered to the comfort of your own home. And we come and visit you three times a week to supervise your exercise session. So if you're someone that's found it hard previously to have the motivation to exercise, when someone comes to knock on your door three times a week, um, you don't really have anywhere to hide, I guess. Um, <laughs> there is a catch, though. We're looking for sort of a specific population. We're looking for women who've had pregnancy diabetes before. And um, what we're hoping to show with this study is that we can prevent those women from getting it in subsequent pregnancy. So if you have had GDM or know someone that's had it in a previous pregnancy and they're in the early stages, please um, come and chat to me afterwards or, or have a look at our webpage. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Look, I'm going to talk uh, briefly, and my disclaimer here is that this is actually Cherie. She's our poster girl for the... Um, the flyer tonight. This was her last year when she was pregnant with her little son, Eli. She's the expert in this area, but I'm going to report what she's sort of given me to say um, as well as I can, given she couldn't be here. Healthy eating in pregnancy, there's a few things that we need to increase. Iron intake, we need to make sure that you've got enough iron. And often that'll be tested for regularly during pregnancy, but you can also ask for um, that to be checked when you have your blood tests as well need to increase the amount of calcium that we're eating. Generally, we need to have around about three serves of dairy per day. Obviously, pasteurised uh, dairy from the last slides. Uh, increasing omega-3 has been found to be really beneficial for the baby's brain development, and this can be um, in various fish and legumes and, and different things. Again, sort of heard a lot about omega-3. Also, supplements are very popular, fish oil supplements. The thing to avoid there is cod liver oil uh, during pregnancy, which is probably um, welcome news. Folate I'm going to talk about in a moment, but um, the Telethon Institute here with Professors Carol Bauer and Professor Fiona Stanley have been instrumental in leading to the uh, mandatory fortification of um, breads and flour in, in Australia with, with folate and also iodine, um, which is something that actually most people um, are deficient in. So it's something that can, it's in pretty much every supplement, but also now we've got some fortification uh, of foods to help there. Can you really eat for two? Well, unfortunately not. Um, but it's not the time to diet either. It's absolutely not the time to diet. You need to increase your energy intake by around 15 to 25%. Now, BMI is something we calculate by um, dividing your weight by height squared. 
And again, it'll depend on your status beforehand. If you're underweight, you may need to gain more weight than pregnancy. Um, if you're in the sort of healthy weight range versus obese or, or overweight, it'll change what you need to, um, to gain during pregnancy. Your metabolism increases right through to the, the third trimester. So again, it's really important to keep the energy intakes up and, and not be dieting. A few little things with, with diet, I guess um, extra to the listeria that we talked about earlier. Um, mercury in fish, generally the tuna and salmon are okay, but just don't overdo it, just a couple of serves per week. Uh, the, the deep fish and the big fish that live for a long time can accumulate mercury. They also eat other fish, um, so shark, swordfish, orange roughy, those are the sort of fishes. And all of this information is on the Fazan's website as well. Constipation can be a really big problem during pregnancy. Very important to keep your fluid intake high, um, fibre intake and, and to, to look at foods that are high in fibre or you might need a fibre supplement depending on, on what your care provider says and exercise. Um, nausea and vomiting for a lot of women um, continued not, not just in the first trimester but also all the way through. Some um, evidence to talk about ginger and vitamin B6 in relieving that, the dry crackers, uh, etc. Hopefully for most of you that, that will start to resolve. Uh, heartburn, again, so this is something that you might want to look at smaller portions and avoiding your more acidic and your spicy foods um, during pregnancy if you're suffering from those complaints. Foods naturally high in folate. Uh, again, most women are taking folate supplements even before pregnancy if you're thinking about planning a pregnancy or at least while you're pregnant. Um, but if you are looking at, at foods in your diet, you've got your lentils, leafy greens, your citrus foods, asparagus, kidney beans, broccoli, avocado, which also is high in omega-3. Tomato juice, unfortunately you can't make a Bloody Mary during pregnancy out of it, but um, tomato juice is also high in folate. So with all of this, and sorry for rushing it through, but I do want to make sure we've got enough time to, to hear from our panel and, and hear questions at the end. This is Professor John Rampono, who was the Head of Psychological Medicine um, at King Edward. He, the most wonderful man who sadly passed away last week, but um, he was the kindest, loveliest man and um, I think there's a few of us who had the pleasure of working with him and he just was a lovely, gentle person. He came along to the forum that we held last year to talk about risk in pregnancy and the first thing he said was the first thing that was said in the room. He said, we just need people to know that the first time you care for your baby is not the first time you hold the baby in your arms, it's while you're pregnant. And that first environment and, and promoting a message of it's what you can do instead of always focusing on what you're not allowed to do and the judgment. And they're such beautiful words that I've thought about since and even more um, meaningful now, now that, um, sadly, um, John has passed. So what are the happier way forward that we can, we can think about? Positive messages. Like John says, your first environment is the womb. So what are the things you can do to make that the healthiest place for your baby to be? Celebrity endorsement, this was an idea that I heard at, at a, a workshop a couple of years ago where it was in, in Canada and they were very min, much into talking about celebrities and they said Beyonce at the time had just announced her pregnancy. They said, what if she stood up and she talked about, I've quit smoking, I'm not drinking and said all these positive things. What would that do for those high-risk women that we often have trouble uh, reaching? Again, as we saw with Rebecca Twigley, it doesn't always work out nicely, but it's an idea that I think we could, we could really start promoting. And get real messages out there. There's some good days, there's some bad. Um, empowering women as well. Instead of sort of telling them things, just to ask them how they're going. Talk about the right decision for you. And I do hear that a lot, which is fantastic. But instead of telling people what you did or what you've heard is right, asking them to kind of see how these messages might relate for them. Someone said to start at high school in sex education, to start talking about women's the pregnancies and healthy pregnancies and ways to keep your body really healthy so that we start these things early and we, we can model positive behaviour and break those cycles that we see of, of sort of high risk leading to, to high risk leading to high risk. Encouraging acceptance that most of the time what you're doing is, is, is okay. Um, do what you can at the time. Don't put pressure on yourself to be a particular way and to conform to particular uh, expectations. And something I'm really passionate about is, is lobbying for, for routine antenatal care and that may be something that as researchers we can really work harder on doing. Um, what if the child health nurse that comes to visit you after pregnancy came to visit you while you were pregnant as well? What if we could get extra funding for antenatal visits? A lot of women won't need that, but particularly disadvantaged women, it might be really, really helpful to be able to get that contact earlier on. Expense can sometimes prevent people 
um, from getting extra support. And also what we find, and especially with things like stress and anxiety, depression, individual support's really important. It's a lot harder and it's a lot more expensive uh, than community groups, but sometimes that, that individual support can be good. People who know me for thinking, oh gosh, she's on the Titanic again. But this is sort of, I guess, one of my, my favourite points is that I, I had this idea that when um, the Titanic sank, there was this cry, according to the movie anyway, of women and children first and, and women and children were kind of prioritised in society and we really thought about women and children differently. And whether or not our society's kind of lost that a little bit, that now if, if the Titanic's sinking, it's every man for himself running for the and woman for themselves running for the, the life raft. Have we lost that, that idea in society that we need to be looking after um, the next generation? And then someone said to me when I presented it, a statistician here said, you know, Monique, it was only on the upper decks that it was women and children first. If you were below the decks, you went down with the ship. I thought, well, that's even more perfect because that's what the analogy kind of really it means for our society, that if you are disadvantaged, you're going down with the ship with some of these risk factors when we're talking about risk, often we are talking about the worried well. We're talking about women who are doing everything they can to make sure their pregnancy is helpful. But we can't forget those women in society who perhaps don't have the same resources and the same uh, advantages who might be going down with the ship. And anything we can do to encourage more resources for this area of health is really important. So in summary, we can't eliminate risk. We just need to accept it. We... The focus on a healthy pregnancy is far better for us than focusing on what might go wrong. <coughs> Our greatest support um, is each other, so it's not about judging each other, but it's about supporting each other. And please, if you can, if you're not in a high-risk pregnancy, relax and, and enjoy this unique time of life as much as you can. And with that, I'll, I'll hand over to any questions that, um, that we might have. And I was just wondering if uh, there's anything us dads to be can do to help in the pregnancy process. Do you know, dads to be are really neglected, and you've probably noticed that. <laughs> But it's something that often gets brought up um, that you can feel sometimes, and especially if you're, uh, there's a high-risk pregnancy, men can often feel quite helpless because they're there and they're a part of it, but it, it seems like it's not the same things aren't happening or you're not getting that same sort of uh, attention from, from the care providers. We do know um, in terms of stress and, and anxiety and depression, it can affect men as well. So it's not something that only affects women in pregnancy. We hear a lot about postnatal depression as a female thing. It also does affect dads as well. Um, in general, being there as a support and there's someone to talk to, to listen to, that social support that we talked about through pregnancy. I think um, sometimes... Uh, and maybe here we go into some stereotypes, but men tend to be a bit more rational sometimes. So they might be good, really good people to be able to talk about um, risk and, and, and evaluate risks realistically. Any comments to that? I think the main thing that um, uh, partners can, can do is, is just, just help whenever you can. Just, you know, do, do more around the house, cook dinner, clean the house, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to actually add to that. There's some fantastic books out there for dads. One of the ones I'd... Um, oh, and DVDs. If you're not into reading, there's a fantastic DVD called Being Dad and there's a follow-up called Being Dad, Bringing the Baby Home. And I know that these are actually... Um, they have been available um, at places like Big W, but they're also available at the King Edward Consumer Library, which anyone can, um, can actually access that, even if you're not birthing at King Edward. So... That being Dad DVD is a fantastic DVD. It's like um, having a conversation with mates, but if you don't actually want to talk to your own mates about <laughs> pregnancy and babies and all that sort of stuff, it's like they've brought mates into your home to be able to talk about blokey stuff about being a dad. There actually is also um, an antenatal um, series, a class for dads, which is hosted at, at pubs, different pubs around the area, and it's basically just dads having a beer, <laughs> talking about, you know, everything in a dad kind of way. I was trying to get my husband to do it for us, but he, he didn't do it. But I have heard it's good, so... Do the guidelines for pregnancy change after miscarriage? So, no guidelines specifically. However, if you've had more than three miscarriages in a row, uh, it's recommended that you see a maternal fetal medicine specialist or specialist obstetricians because they will test you for a range of things that, that might um, explain while you've had... While you've had recurrent miscarriages. I just wanted to know about the flu vaccine while you're pregnant. Is that something that 
we should definitely do? What are the risks and, and at what point should you be looking at having it first trimester? Or Yes, um, it is a recommendation that you do get an influenza vaccine when you are pregnant. Um, when you are pregnant, your immune system is a little bit compromised. So if you do get the flu, um, the, well, while you are pre pregnant, you could end up with a much worse um, case of the flu than if you were not pregnant. So if you get the flu vaccine during pregnancy, you can protect yourself, but you also protect your bubs because bubs can't have um, a flu vaccine for the first six months of life. And bubs can still get infected with, in, with, with, with flu um, in that first um, six, six months of life. So if you're um, having an influenza vaccination during, during pregnancy, you are protecting your, your, your baby. It is an individual choice um, that you need um, to, to make. Um, all we can say is that it is recommended. It's recommended by the National Health and Medical Research Council. It's recommended by the um, Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, which are the group of researchers and clinicians that form immunisation policy for Australia. It's also recommended by the Royal, Ob uh, Royal Australian College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Um, you can, the best time to have a flu vaccine is probably in the second or third trimester, but also depends on where we are in terms of the flu season. So flu season's sort of starting around about now, so if you're pregnant, I'd get vaccinated with flu now. Um, there's no, um, there's always um, a small risk with getting any vaccination, just, you know, a small, a sore arm, um, you know, might get a little bit of, you know, a little bit tired and things like that, but you know, it's, it's all about measuring up your, um, the, the benefit to, to the risk. And um, for me, to me, the benefit of having a flu vaccine far outweighs a small little risk of actually getting a vaccine while you're pregnant. Yeah, are packaged salads um, in Australia considered to be unsafe? A lot of the guidelines talk about salad bars and salads that are left sitting and, and left sitting without being refrigerated. I've sort of, I think there's things, I guess now it's um, so much that's pre-prepared that you can see, you know, salad leaves in a bag. Is that the same as a packaged salad? And that's where things get a little bit confusing. Um, but in general, I, I guess, you know, as you normally would look at the use by dates on things and if it has been sitting out for a long time, perhaps that might be use your discretion and think maybe not that particular one. The Fazan's guidelines do talk about, talk about cut up fruit and things like that, pre-packaged foods like that and they say to avoid those. But again, I think it's probably about the length of time it's been sitting there, um, more than the fact that it's been, been packaged. If it's fresh, it's probably OK. What, what, would, what would happen in this same salad situation? Um, <laughs> obviously, I'm not pregnant. But <laughs> if, um, if there was a presence of listeria on the salad leaves, would I display any symptoms after eating? Or would, I wouldn't know. Like, so Claire has them, she might give baby could be hurt, but if I have nothing happens, or mm. would I be ill, or would I have diarrhoea or something? It's, it's, a, it's a really good question. With listeria, um, it actually, for most people, they can get infected and really have no symptoms. Um, it's when, as Hannah said, your immune system is compromised during pregnancy and also in the elderly. So what we saw in January with the Jindy cheese um, situation was deaths of, of older people um, and a miscarriage of a pregnant pregnant woman with that with that thing. But but generally, people you, like you could be eating it and, and you wouldn't know that it happened. But what we do see with listeria, it's an outbreak. It's not like it's in a bit of this, but it's not in anything else and there's only an isolated case here and there. When something is infected with listeria, it, it tends to be what they call an outbreak. And so in the US, they had, I think, a couple of years ago, um, something in a ham factory. So the processed ham, there was meats coming, an outbreak there. Again, we saw the jindy cheese and the wattle cheese. And that's why when, things, when these outbreaks do happen, they're isolated to particular... Product. Any tips for managing morning sickness or 24 hours a day sickness? And is there any risk <laughs> with some of the medications that, um, like a Danzatron, is something I've been prescribed? And I've had mixed information from, you know, on site versus um, the pharmacist and the obstetrician. Um, I, I suppose it depends who you speak to, but I think when you're dealing with medications like on Danzatron, that you need to have an in-depth discussion with your medical practitioner, the person that's actually prescribed it. We, we do use on Dancitron for morning sickness and it's, it's um, deemed, I suppose, at this stage to be relatively safe. Uh, but I think that 
it's um, a, a question that you do have to have with the person that is actually prescribing it to you. Sometimes when you're pregnant, um, you know, you might just have a cold or do something and think, is it okay to take this? So the um, just over the so they can give you advice on over the counter um, preparations as well as once you've had, to ba- had your baby, if you're breastfeeding, you know, is this drug I've been prescribed? Is it okay to take? So they're a really great resource for anybody within the state to contact. It's the um, pharmacy advice line at King Edward Memorial Hospital. The number, I think, is 93402723, and it's a really good resource. Do you know, that, that's just reminded me something that I'm amazed that, that people don't know, having worked in the system, but actually a lot of people don't know that if you're having any problems and you need to go to an emergency department when you're pregnant, you do go to King Edward. You don't have to be going to be delivering there. That's the emergency department for pregnancy and and. So it definitely something you can call the advice line. You don't need to be on their, on their books as such to be able to use those resources. I have a question about um, use of supplements and multivitamins during the pregnancy. I know about the um, pregnancy multivitamins. What about uh, calcium or fish oil that are sold separately and are they recommended or not indicated? I mean, I think I've probably passed to Louise again for this one or Kim may know something on this too. Um, it can be very hard. Often those, any medication like that says ask your doctor, so it leaves you a little bit in the lurch with, with knowing what to do. But it says that because that's probably the, the best thing to do in terms of asking your care provider. But anything else to add there, Louise? Look, I think the um, King Edward advice line is a good resource for people and you do have to make sure that you do discuss what you take with your um, health care provider at, and that line because you, what you might do, you could be taking a couple of supplements and you might be overdosing in something like vitamin A, uh, which they recommend that you don't have um, large doses of in pregnancy. So I think you actually need to uh, get your care provider and give them all of the information as, a spo- as opposed to just saying, can I take this and can I take that? Because it might be what you're taking in conjunction. I was just wondering if there was any research at all about quantity and quality of sleep while pregnant. (laughs) I hope not, because that's just going to make us all feel worse, I think, I'm sure. (laughs) Again, Kim, you might know more on sleep. um, I can only comment in relation to exercise, and and there is some evidence to suggest that regular exercise during pregnancy can assist with with quality of sleep. Um, There's not too much research on it, um, and that's actually another thing we're looking at in the cycle study. But I can say that the women participating in the study um, comment anecdotally all the time that they think that's one of the benefits they're experiencing. I don't know, I can only speak in terms of exercise, though. Well, I know when we're evaluating mood and, and stress and things in pregnancy, we do look at disruptions in sleeping patterns, but we certainly don't say well, because you're having sleeping problems while you're pregnant, you might be at risk for depression because it's such a common thing that so many women experience. So it's kind of part of the part and parcel there um, as well. So sleep, sleep is evaluated a little bit differently in pregnancy. We've um, probably we'll, we'll finish up. I just wanted to say because we're researchers and we can't quite get away from our studies, there are some pamphlets out there for the Healthy Pregnancy Study, which is being run at UWA by Kimberly McCauley, who's sitting down here. If you are uh, less than 15 weeks pregnant, it's just a matter of filling out a couple of questionnaires, um, and the details are on the flyer there. There's also a study for women who have um, who have diabetes type one or they have a partner with type 1 diabetes or a child, previous child with type 1 diabetes. That's the India study and there's a pamphlet out there as well. So if you are interested in participating in any of our research projects, we'd always love to have you. But thank you very much um, for coming along. Did you want to say something to finish? Because I most particularly wanted to thank all of our panel, um, Louise and Hannah and Kim, and of course, Monique Robinson for pulling this all together. Will you join me in thanking them all? So I hope and I'm pretty confident that that would have helped you navigate a little bit through the various information that you would have seen online and elsewhere about pregnancy and risk. Our next public seminar, I hope you might really be interested in as well. It will be on the 14th of May and it's about the issue of immunisation, vaccination. So another hot topic, lots of really interesting information. We're going to have some fantastic speakers on that one and also a chance, most importantly, for you to ask the questions that you've wanted to ask about those sorts of um, issues. As you go out, there's also a little... um, 
little show bag for you with some information about the Institute. We do loads of research that if you have children or you're having children, I'm sure will be of interest to you. We have a regular e-news that we'd love you to subscribe to and that way we can give you information about what's happening with West Australian children and information that's really relevant to you. So thank you so much for coming along today. Thank you to the team for putting it together and once again, thanks very much to our speakers. Thank you.